so here's a surprising stat. 60% of the congregation right here at the Church of the Messiah are African-American men under the age of 30. Pastor Barry arranged for us to meet with some of these young men from the church so we could hear their very frank and personal stories. Here's one Detroit's Will Glover. So the children are going to be leading us. We're in the basement at the Church of Messiah for a meeting hosted by community How development advocates of Detroit. One group was noticeably absent, the young men that make up 60% of Pastor Barry's congregation. We have a lot of young black men in this church, a lot of young ones. On purpose, they are not in this room. They don't want to have a conversation with adults, per se. They want to have their conversation among themselves because they always feel as though that somebody will attack them. Somebody will criticize them for having an opinion, and they don't want to do the back and forth. They want to get to the issues. They want to be part of the solutionaries, but they want to be heard um, and respected and validated for what it is they believe and how they feel without judgment. We went back to Pastor Barry, who assured the cautious young men that they wouldn't be judged and could trust us with their story, with their voices. You're doing stuff, you know, you're trying to do the right thing, and bad stuff still happening, you know. Like, it'd be the equivalent of standing at, like, the bottom of a mountain, and everything you needed was at the top. You can't stay down here, and it's going to be hard as hell getting up there, but you got to do it. I've never stayed in the house for a whole year my whole life months and then I'm moving with somebody else. I have no more grandmothers. They're gone. I have nowhere to go. My mom's, my mom and dad, they're still together. They just got the kids sticking. I can't do nothing about it. Now I have two kids. I'm trying to figure out what I can do. He's the only one that's been blessing me and helping me and Pastor Barry. I don't have nothing. I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm very, very stressed out. Like I can be flipping some chick, you know, working. Then you see everybody in the lobby just run outside. You like, then you go like, what's going on? You see somebody just get shot up at the gas station. And it was only reason I'm working there because that's the only job I could find. And it was like, you know, ain't really no jobs in the city. So of course it's gonna be a job in like the roughest place. So you know, I'm, I'm sticking it through there, but at the same time I see so much stuff that is changing my character and changing like my view of the world. But it's clear these young men are acutely aware of their position in society. It's essential to navigating the realities of their daily lives. Me personally, I don't, really speak on what happens in the, in the neighborhood, what happens in, in politics, school, anything, or religion. Because at the end of the day, what does it really have to do with me if y'all still not putting no real food in my mouth, no real job, no money in my pockets? I still gotta get out here and strive and slave and do whatever I gotta do to make my next dollar. No matter if it's something legal or illegal, and that's sad. The leaders, um, they're too out of touch. Um, they don't really understand the real issues, and they're not proximate to the problems that people are really dealing with. Um, and a lot of leaders don't want to be. And if you're not close to the problem, if you're not proximate to the issue that's going on, you're not really in a position to, to be able to change it or to really help and understand. After our talk at the Church of Messiah, we spent a day with 24-year-old Dwight Roston. Today, he's making deliveries for Nikki's Ginger Tea, a company started in the basement of the Church of Messiah. Not only does the general American's voice not matter because it's just billionaires versus everybody else now, but on top of that, I'm black. So everybody else who is excluded out of the whole billionaire club, they still look at me like, you know, you're not even in our club. <laughs> right. And do you think that's part of the problem with like what the narrative of Detroit's comeback and all that type of stuff is? It's, I mean, it's not really not, I mean, it's, it's not really inclusive. It's not even that, the whole gentrification thing, because it's, it's, I think that's just misunderstood. It's real, but you gotta look at it as what it is. It's not really people taking over, it's just people moving somewhere and building a bubble that only includes them. Right. That's what being a real Detroiter is about, honestly. It's about knowing that more than likely, Everybody else who has a job that their job is supposed to represent you, they're probably going to not do that job. And you still have to do your job on top of that. You said you have three daughters. So how do you feel when you're thinking about their future in the city? What do you, you know, what do you, what do you hope for? What are you afraid of? I definitely hope that they grow up in a place where opportunities just 
abundant, you know, um, because me just experiencing what I experienced growing up and just trying to trying to get jobs, trying to find resources to do things that you're interested in, trying to find programs, anything like that. It's always just extremely scarce or it's a financial issue. I never want them to not chase a dream or to not, you know, go for a goal or something like that because it's too expensive or that because it's just not available. When you have a system set up like the way we have here in the United States that sends kids to school for 12 years for a ridiculous amount of hours trained to become factory workers. They don't learn to value themselves. They don't learn to value what they do. And at that point, they don't learn to value what other people do because those people don't value what they do. This is created because of these lack of resources, because of these lacks, uh, this lack of incentive to go out there and do things. Kids want to improve their lives. I don't know a single person that doesn't want to actively make something better than what they have. Despite their challenges, they still hold out hope. At what point on this mountain are you now? Metaphorically speaking, there are several mountains, you know? The whole racial mountain, I don't think we'll ever get to the top of that. Uh, as far as the mountain for my parenthood thing, I'm pretty much on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then business and everything else is, is in between. Um, but it's not necessarily the mountain from going, it's not making it to the top of the mountain. It's the person you become as you're growing up the mountain, which is really important because nobody lives on top of a mountain. You still got to come back down sometimes. Here with us now is a young man from the Church of Messiah, Dwight Roston. Oh, also God. joining me, our third circuit court judge, Kelly Ramsey, and Detroit Police Captain Kyra Joy Hope. Welcome. Thank you Roger. for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Dwight, I want to start with you. We saw you in the, the film there talking about uh, your membership here in the church and the things that it's done for you. But a couple of years ago, you had a really interesting idea for a program uh, that, uh, that you, you, you thought would make uh, the relationships between young black men and the police in this city a little better. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So. The program is called the LEAP program. It wasn't called that when it was the idea. Um, but it really came from, I was on the side of the church cleaning up some, some trash by the bus stop. Some police rode past and they were both white. And they looked at me and you know, there's this immediate tension. Um, and something was just like, wave at him and see what he does. And I waved at him and he just froze. Like he, like nobody had waved at him all day or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it let me know that there's a disconnect that we don't look at each other as people. You know, as, as, as African-Americans, we don't necessarily look at police officers as people. Um, and, you know, some police officers don't look at African-Americans as people. So that on top of, you know, social media, all of the videos, you know, that were being shared of people being killed by police officers, um, most of them not going to jail, and, you know, riots and different things like that. Me and my cousins and Pastor Barry got together and pretty much in an effort to be like, or to say, we don't want this to happen here. And what do we have to do to make sure that this does not happen here? So the idea we had was to take young black men and police officers and have them do something together for young people. Yeah. Uh, and if, if, yeah, go ahead. And I really wonder uh, what it would have been like if uh, you had been standing on the side of the church and waved at a police officer and had all of these thoughts about this and you hadn't been connected to this church. I mean, I feel like the church is the way uh, that you get to turn that into something that reaches lots of other people in the city and, and maybe makes a difference. I think it's a really interesting example of the role that the church is playing in this community. Yeah, I think the, the, the role that Church of Messiah plays in Island View is the role that every church should play in every community. Um, it gave us, <laughs> it, gave, it gave me a voice. It gave me a place to where I knew I could go walk right in here with this idea and that something would be either done about it or that the wheels would start turning to see some change and some opportunity um, to just, you know, change the status quo, if you will. So. If it wasn't here, it'd just be another household conversation, you know, where we complain about what's going on 
where we complain about how things are, but we don't actually get up and do something to change it. Uh, Judge Ramsey, uh, in your courtroom, uh, sometimes you are trying to find uh, ways to, to reach people beyond what the criminal justice system requires you to do. Uh, and Church of the Messiah has sort of come into your purview as, as, as one of those ways. Can you talk about how that works? Uh, certainly. And, you know, obviously I have a position in the community to administer justice both to victims and the individuals who stand in front of me. But I also believe that my job expands to include more than incarcerating an individual. And I try my very best to convince those individuals who stand in front of me that they have more talent and more ability than they can possibly imagine. And that with hard work and determination that they too could choose a different lifestyle. But when I say that, I have to give them the opportunity. And I have uh, been blessed with knowing Pastor Barry Randolph for a number of years now. I consider him a friend of mine. So I pass out handouts to individuals who appear before me. And I pass out a felon-friendly job list. And at the bottom of that felon-friendly job list, I explain that I am referring my probationers to a friend of mine, Barry Randolph and I write this address down. And most of the individuals who come to see me, if not the majority of the individuals who come to see me, need the services that are offered here, whether they be employment services, housing services, or basic life services that many of them don't know how to accomplish on their own, whether it's getting a driver's license or state identification. Things like that are necessary for employment. Resume writing skills. And it's not a court order, and I simply say, if you want it, it's there. If you want it, it's here. But I do require most individuals who are on probation to the court to seek and obtain and maintain legal employment. And then I offer them the list and the opportunity to come here for the employment services that are offered here, the housing services that are offered here. Um, a gentleman returned to see me with tears in his eyes and said, I've never filled out an application before. And regardless of what position they're in, when they come to see me or they stand in front of me, you know, Pastor Randolph can take them from whatever level they're, that they're at and bring them forward to be in a position to seek the employment that I believe is helpful in keeping an individual from returning to the life of crime. I'd like to take a brief moment, if I may, and thank developer Joe, um, who has employed more than a couple handfuls of individuals who answer to me. Who came through your courtroom. Who right? came through my courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's working. It's working. It, it, it's more than working. Yeah, yeah. It's more than working. And uh, father came in a couple months ago with tears in his eyes that his son came here, the father came with his son, met Pastor Randolph, Joe happened to be on premise, I believe at the time, <laughs> as the story goes, and basically took one look at the young man and said, I'll see you tomorrow morning, and they left here, came into the courtroom with tears wow. in their eyes to tell me, thank you for getting my son a job. Yeah. Wow, wow. So it's been a wonderful opportunity. So, Captain Hope, uh, the LEAP program that Dwight brought up is, is one way that, uh, that the police department interacts with the young people here in the church. I wonder if it's inspired uh, a different approach maybe in other places as well. Is this, is this uh, moving the needle, I guess, in terms of police relationships with young black men? Absolutely. And I, I think it's very, very courageous for everyone to meet. And I believe that the best thing that we can ever have is really community trust mm -hmm. and communication. And to meet someone right where they are and have that transparent conversation to actually look into this young man's eyes and truly say, hold me accountable. But what is it that you need? Mm -hmm. Because every community is different. So, so how unusual for you is that in your career as a police officer that you even get the opportunity to ask that question 
and ask it in the presence of somebody like Dwight? Well, I make it my business, actually, <laughs> to place myself um, amongst the youth and, and our community. Um, Pastor Barry has brought everybody together in such a way, I can't even really describe it. But once I met him, I was part of the team, and I support every initiative that Pastor Barry and the Church of Messiah has. I stand behind the men and women of this church and this beautiful community that we're in. We cannot do it by ourselves with the police department. This is truly a community effort, not just with our residents, but inclusive of our business partnerships as well. Uh, Dwight, I wonder what you have seen since Leap started in terms of uh, improvement in the way that uh, you interact with police. Now when you wave at the cops, do they act like uh, <laughs> they've never seen you before? <laughs> well, it depends what, what, what cop I'm waving at. Right. Um, but there is, there is a, a sort of mission, you know, to get out of the car, you know, in, in, in a way, because you know, you see a lot of, lot of police officers ride around, you know, different things, but in the summertime, you have police officers walking around the neighborhood, visiting the basketball courts, um, even riding their bikes, you know, doing things that as people who live in the tension of, you know, being black and, you know, dealing with police officers who may or may not be black, um, there is this, this calming effect when you see them doing something that isn't like patrol and control. You know, like I had said to Captain Hope, you know, we, we, we don't look at you guys as real people sometimes. You know, I met a cop who could break dance and I was like, cops can't break dance. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's bringing everything down to a oh, we're humans, you know, we're all people. And they're not cops 24 seven, you know, they go home, they have families, they have things that they like and things that they dislike. So if we can meet each other at that, moment as opposed to meeting each other you know in uniform or out of uniform then it's a lot a lot yeah easier transition it's a lot safer too right <laughs> definitely uh, i also want you to talk a little about the fact that you have three little girls who are uh growing up in this church and in all of this environment uh, I, I imagine in 10 years you're going to have your hands full yes uh, <laughs> yes uh, but uh how important is that and what do you think they're getting from the things that they see not just on sunday here but all of the things that uh, that are going on in this church something that's extremely important to me is that not only are they successful women but they have a love for their people and they have a love for the community that they were raised in. When they, they, first of all, they see me get up and go to work every day, you know, even they complain about it. Like, oh, daddy, you can skip work today. <laughs> um, but it's to let them know that life isn't necessarily all about having fun, you know? And sometimes when you're successful, your success should trickle down to somebody else and it should become an opportunity or you, sh you should mentor someone who was in the position that you were in because the opportunities that we have coming to this church are blessings they're not just opportunities because we know other neighborhoods there are like four thousand churches in the city of detroit and there's only one church of the messiah so for them to have this church as their home for them to have the role models that they do to see the things happening to see us go from sitting at a table talking about something to there it is being built um, is powerful, and I hope that it it makes them better people um, as far as when they grow up and what they want to do. And I also want them to, if the opportunity does not exist, create it. If not for yourself, for somebody else. Yeah. Wow! What a great, what a great sentiment. <laughs>